Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me. We are on to chapter number 11. Chapter number 11. I'm sorry. I said the wrong thing. Chapter number 10. Chapter number 10. I wish we were on to chapter number 11 already, right? Ah, uh, yes. Don't worry. We will be shortly. This is a very short chapter. Um, in this chapter, uh, the, the next several chapters, we're going to go through rather quickly. Um, it's nice to know about what happened then. It's, very, it's important. But it's not quite as vital to um, our our country's founding necessarily as some of the other stuff in, in, in history. Um, since we only have a limited amount of time, we have to prioritize. And so because of that, we're gonna, one of the things we're going to do is prioritize um, here in the next couple of chapters. We're going to move rather quickly. Um, who was the first president? It's an easy answer. You all know. It's George Washington. George Washington was our first president. When he was elected president, he, 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 he established a precedent. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tradition that was followed. And that, that, that tradition was a two terms in power, and he established what they call a cabinet. Originally, the, the Constitution said that um, the president may require written opinions of the heads of the executive branch departments. But, basically, cabinet is a cabinet meetings gradually evolved in the Washington administration. Okay, that is the people he had selected to help him run. And they had, they had it divided into three parts. That was the Secretary of State, which was Thomas Jefferson. The Secretary of the Treasury, which is Alexander Hamilton. And the Secretary of War, which is Henry Knox. Um, it is important to note here that Washington offered the Secretary of the Treasury to Robert Morris, but Robert Morris turned it down and instead appoint, instead suggested Hamilton, who Washington chose. Um, Robert Morris uh, turned down the option to run for president and also turned down the second, uh, the, the, the second most important position, the Secretary of the Treasury. It's, that's important to note. Um, we, we see here... Uh, um, who became the first Chief Justice? We also had a court established, and the first the first Supreme Court Justice, or the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, is John Jay. As I mentioned earlier, John Jay, he a very seasoned um, veteran um, in, in, in political affairs. He, he was the individual behind the, the Treaty of Paris. He also is involved with another treaty later on. Um, he's the first Chief Justice. He was one of the writers of the Federalist Papers. This individual doesn't get quite as much, as much recognition as he deserves but he was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, Alexander Hamilton. He, he, there's not a question about him specifically. Um, number four is, but it's Alexander the Hamilton adopted many of the ideas that were Robert Morris's and, and, and adopted them to, to, as, for, to establish the United States in good uh, stead financially. One, and they did several things. One of the things things was that um, the United States paid they paid um, for the war debt. Now, they could have just refused to pay for it, um, but the new federal, um, in, in, in this way, he, um, he really believed that they ought to uphold their debts. Funding at par is what he, he believed. He, he, th um, he therefore boldly urged Congress to fund the entire national debt at par which meant they would pay off the debts at face value plus accumulated interest, and then enormous total of more than fifty-four million. Now, it's poor, our textbook discusses here a little bit, possibly why um, that he uh, why why some of this is. And he was a firm believer in banking and big industry. Um, he was a bit a big into banking and economics and in the big business, and he firmly believed that those who and a supporter of the wealthier groups. And he was a firm believer that those who had taken out, paid, given the federal government money as loans during the war ought to be paid back in, in, the, in its entirety. Now, if you, if you were one of those people, you, you, which were the wealthier group, you wanted your money back. But if you were, um, if you were some of the poorer people, you, you'd say, no, 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 let them be. Um, they've already got plenty of money. We don't want a federal government to a a incur debt. But he actually wanted the federal government to incur debt. He also wanted the federal government to take all of this very state debts all under under and get empty to wipe out the state debts by doing this um but by doing by doing this he, he thought that this would chain the states more tightly to the federal chariot and it did um some states had heavy debts like massachusetts 
So I'm a small. That's like Virginia weren't very happy, but the trade basically was in exchange for 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 this happening um, that the. They agreed that the new capital would be built on the shores of the Potomac, um, there in, near Virginia, and and therefore they and there and then Massachusetts would get its debt paid. Um, it, it's interesting to note here that our textbook says anyone less determined to establish such a healthy public credit could have sidestepped 13 million of back interest and could have avoided the state debts entirely. Okay. But he, he strongly believed that the United States needed to have a strong credit rating, that there needed to be a belief in the United States monetary system. Um, we're going to go on to quick here real quick, number four. Hamilton versus Jefferson, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists on the Constitution. Okay, um, and this is the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. There was on the Constitution, but it spilled over. And, and Hamilton versus Jefferson... It, it became a, a, a discussion of the elite and the money powers versus the less money powers, um, and, and, and the poorer classes of society. And Hamilton and Jefferson um, contrasted. Also, and here we have the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and this is the, what you need to know for this question. Hamilton in general believed that the Constitution, that whatever the Constitution did not forbid, it for permitted. And Jefferson, in contrast, believed that what it did not permit, it forbade. So Hamilton said, if it doesn't ex ex say it in black and white that you can't, you can do it. And Je Jefferson says, what, if it doesn't say you can do it in black and white, then you can't do it. You can see how there's a big difference there. And, and we've, we've wavered back and forth between the two of them um, throughout, throughout history, those two, two, two views. Um, what is the Whiskey Rebellion? One of the things, the taxes that was immediately established, or established very shortly after, was a tax on... Um, was a, a tax on alcohol, basically rye and corn. They call it the whiskey tax. Okay, um, he he, uh, they're trying to raise money, and so they begin to, to um, they begin to tax whiskey and, and corn and rye, which is made in whiskey. Um, and it, it, Hamilton believed it was um, frivolity. The, the, you know, it's a tax on frivolity, and. Um, the, in, now, in the western area, the western um, part of, parts of the United States, at that time would be, you know, in the western Pennsylvania, um, they didn't like it. The people there drank a lot of whiskey. They did not like. They regard it as a tax, on, and a, but as a burden on an economic, economic necessity. And often they traded in whiskey as, as a way of payment. So it was a tremendous problem. Um, what we have here is a, a little rebellion. Defiant distillers erected whiskey poles. Um, some raised the cry of liberty and no excise, exercise, excise. They tarred and feathered revenue officers and they brought the whole thing to a halt. Um, there, there was, in fact, such a, such a, such a um, outcry that, that, um, that there, there was believed to be an insurrection. George Washington responded with strength and vigor. And, and this is very important. He established very clearly that that the federal government would not be messed with. He raised 13,000 men and marched with an army to, um, um, to the western Pennsylvania where, where, there, where they found not much of an insurrection as more of a riotous group of people. These, many of them, so many of them who are past soldiers, um, um, the, the whiskey boys, they said, were overawed. They were captured. There was a total of three rebels killed. But the, and the two, the two that, two, the two that were captured, that were small time, were were, were eventually let, let let pardoned. But Washington established right then and there, there would not be any. Hey, we don't like this little thing, so little thing, so we're going to start a new rebellion, a new country. He established right then and there, you do it through democratic means. We're not doing it. We're not doing it uh, militarily. Um, really consolidated the power of the United States. Um, number six. What happened in the French Revolution? You'll note in a lot of discussion in the last little bit, we talked about how they were so opposed to democracy, and and, and their their fears were justified. The, the French Revolution broke out shortly after. Um, the French, the, the king of, of France, had, had, had was a firm believer in the ad, a divine divine um, right of rule 
and, and he was an absolute monarch, an absolute monarch. But um, there, there, there was a they, there was a great deal of controversy, a great deal of anger, and eventually it boiled over. Over, um, the, the nation went bankrupt. Um, he kept raising taxes and taxes and taxes on the poor people, and eventually, what, what they were worried about, the mobocracy appeared. A democratic system of the people reigned. But, very shortly, the people then began to kill all of their enemies. It was anarchy, it was chaos, it was mobocracy, it was democracy at its worst. And everything that the Americans were afraid, had, were afraid of in their own country happened in the French country. They called it the Reign of Terror. There was, the gu guillotine was set up, the king was beheaded, and then the head ruling Reign of Terror. Okay? Lots and lots and lots. Thousands and thousands were just murdered, murdered, murdered. Why? Because the majority of the people wanted, at that day, they, 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 they were, somebody riled the masses and the majority hated this group and they thought they, that they should be executed for their beliefs, etc. Right? The, it was the power of the, you had, it was democracy. The people were in power. And very rapidly, just widespread anarchy, chaos. The people in power had no law. They had no authority. There was no governing structure. And there was no one to rule the people. And, that, and the people could not rule. And so what happened is you had this massive problem. And eventually um, you ha you'll have Emperor Napoleon coming out of this, who is not just a monarch or a dictator. He became, tried to be an emperor to conquer the world as a result of this, this crazy democracy. Now you'll see, you probably saw some videos about that. Um, and and you'll, you'll notice that today democracies, like, like, such as in England or um, Germany or Canada, um, they're, they're very unstable governments, okay? Um, I, I live in the Cayman Islands, very unstable governments, okay? Like England is a very unstable government, but they do have a set of rules and, rules and laws, and they also have a look, the English have a monarchy that exists that, although powerless, provides some structure. And these rules and laws provide some structure, and there's a House of Lords in England that sort of provides some structure. But countries without that, the, that have found, like, you, you look at many of the African countries, you look at many of the Eastern European countries that struggle, um, Asian countries, without that, without that um, establishment of some sort of rule or authority or conservatism in the sense of you don't just change everything at the drop of a hat, you have chaos and anarchy. And democracy as a concept only works when the people are virtuous and you have a law, law a system of law. All right? and, and, and that's important to remember because you hear a lot of people saying democracy, oh majority rule, majority rule. Well, our founders firmly believed against majority rule, and they were proven very right just sh very shortly after by some of the, one of the worst systems of government ever known to mankind. What was this? Uh, was was this reign of terror and this French Revolution? All right. Uh, I mean, sh after 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 communism the, the, and and perhaps Nazism or fascism, um, th those are different. But this this democracy was highly unstable and, and resulted in this mass death everywhere. Um, and, and it resulted in mass death around the world as Napoleon then tried to conquer the world. Um, what is the Neutrality Proclamation? The Neutrality Proclamation was George Washington's way of staying out of European wars. He said, Europe, you do your thing, we'll do ours. We don't want to get embroiled in all of your inner little politics and conflicts and make treaties with this person and treaties with that person. And try to be constantly embroiled in that. We're far enough away. We'll be friends with everybody. We're neutral with everybody. And that allowed America to grow and prosper. And over the next 30, 40 years, you'll notice we have another war and some dipl diplomatic problems. But basically, after the, after the War of 1812, there, there's, there's a period of time for about 40, 40 years, um, 50 years, where America is basically, for the most part, doesn't have to worry about foreign intervention in here. And we were given the chance, our country was given the chance to... to from to move from child childhood and its inception to here and just beginning to grow and then to adolescence and become after the Civil War a full grown adult nation. Who is the second president of the United States? That is John Adams. What is John Adams he was a, um what is John Adams' greatest feat? This is not found in the textbook. John Adams um strongly was a Federalist Thomas Jefferson was an anti-federalist. 
They had a vicious dislike of each other, personal dislike. They also had very strong, very strong dif differing beliefs. When Washington was old and retired, uh, John Adams w was elected. He, he had been his vice president, and the Federalists remained in power. Um, and Thomas Jefferson, after, after four years, Adams lost the next election to Jefferson. And instead of causing a war, trying to regain power, fighting war, etc., he did what was, was possibly, or very possibly the first in world history. It may not be the exact first, as far as I know, it's one of the very first. And especially in, in, in this context type of world new government governing structure, the first tr peaceful transfer of power. Not because he was too old, not because he was no longer interested, but because he got voted out. He, he got voted out and he, he gave his office to his bitter rival and enemy, personal enemy. And he gave it to him uh, on, the, on, the understand, uh, on the understanding, knowing that he was going to do things he highly disagreed with. But this was the first peaceful transfer of power in, 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 in this context that I know of. And this dramatically set the precedent for our country. And to this day, our, our nation has always transferred power peacefully. Now, I will note, and this is just a, a note here, some of you are saying, I, I don't see things peaceful in the streets today, and, and, and you're right. And that's probably as close we've ever had to an unpeaceful transfer of power in, in recent time, in, in, in history. Now, there's been various disputes, etc., and you'll, you'll know there's one, not one other one that was very, very, um, very disputed. Um, but and, and then of course Bush Gore in 2000 was was, was somewhat disputed. But e each of those, the, the um, it, it was clear that to the to the to the loser um, that they, they 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 had lost, and they they allowed for peaceful transformation of power. Even those who, who the election was stolen from, and there and there was one one one, one case of an election being stolen, uh, but that 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 was in the 1960s against the Republican candidate, but. It appears, and, and that is what, what it appears to be stolen, I'm going to phrase that. So it, it's not necessarily 100% provable, but it is widely believed by historians and experts on it that this, that it actually was, the election was um, rigged by the dailies in Chicago. But today we see in our country some chaos, some anarchy, some anger, and, and we must remember no matter what side of the fence you're on in, in politics, we must remember that peaceful transfer for a power is one of American is an American invention, and it's something we are very proud of. And let's not throw that away. Even no matter whether you do agree or disagree, it is vital for the safety and security of our nation that we highly support peaceful transfer of power. No matter if it be from Bush to Obama, from Obama to Trump, or if it, or if it's Thomas Jeff, uh, George Washington to John Adams, or John Adams to Thomas Jefferson. The compact theory. What is the compact theory? This is number 10. Number 10. The compact theory. Um, the compact theory is a theory where um, philosophers, that they referred to that the people and the nation ha ha had came into a contact. Compact. The people came, uh, co they came into an agreement with the 13 states in creating the federal government. It's a contract. We are agreeing to be part of the federal government, and in, a, and in, a, and in return, you are promising to appreciate our rights. Very similar to the um, idea that the people are, are, are ruled, uh, the king is governing by the assent of the governed. That, that means the, the, the people assent or agree to the king governing them. Okay, well, in this case, uh, the compact or contact theory is that um, the, the government, the, the, the federal government was existing based on a contract to re to um, repre to secure or to um, allow and to prevent abuses against the rights of the states. Um, the individual states were the final judges of whether or not they had broken the compact or this contract. Okay, and, and understanding this logic, it was used here, and I'm reading out a textbook, Jefferson's Kentucky Resolutions concluded that the federal regime had exceeded the constitutional powers and then nullified a law. And we're going to see this come up later, but it was widely believed and understood up until the Civil War, and, and by most historians, and we, we, uh, that, the, that the states had authority over the federal government. If the federal government passed some stuff that they highly disagreed with, they did have the right to nullify or even secede from the Union, because they, joined, they, they had the freedom to join and they had the freedom to leave. 
Um, Hamilton and Jefferson on the elite. Hamilton versus Jefferson versus the illiterate. Describe the three positions on voting rights and power in the early nation. All right. Hamilton. Those who own the country ought to govern it. Ruled by the aristoc aristocracy. Okay? Hamilton. Okay? Those who own the country. Okay? Those who own the country ought to govern it. Okay? They believe the government should support free enterprise, not, not interfere with it. Jefferson. Jeffersonian re Republicans. Okay? And, and that, that's just... Jefferson, the Jeffersonians believed that the best government was a government that governed least. All right, and they they firmly believed that um, that the the storekeepers, your shop clerks, your um, you know your your common man, your uh, farmers, your laborers. Um, your your artisans, your you know, those people should have the right to vote and that they should have a say in the government. However, Jefferson did not agree with everyone voting. He highly was opposed to that. And this is the third position here. So that, so the second position is Jefferson uh, Hamilton only believed that the and in a summarization, he believed that only the wealthy should those who own the country ought to rule it. Um, Jefferson believed that the middle class ought to have a right to vote and, and, and a right to rule. All right, and Jefferson, however, did not think that he he believed the government was for the people, but he did not think everyone should have the right to vote. He he believed only he he favored government for the people, for only those who are literate enough to inform themselves and wear and wear the mantle of American citizenship citizenship worthily. He argued the ignorant were incapable of self government. He Okay, so he was highly opposed to the illiterate masses at that time, and, and, and again, I hate to use this word, but I'm not sure what other word to use, the underclasses of society governing. So you have here, one only wanted government by the elite, the elite, so you know, call, call it the upper class, so the top 20% of, of the population could vote. Then you have the, uh, Jefferson wants the middle class to be able to vote, so now you got 60% being able to vote, okay, and then you had the underclass, which is the bottom 20%, at, you know, not wanting them to vote, and of course you have slavery in there as the other probably 20% as well. And so, they now they were often considered above um, the underclass sometimes, and they were obvi but obviously were far treated far worse, and, and we're not going there, but they deserve historically, obviously, um, the utmost empathy and sympathy for, for this th their plight. Um, it was a horrible evil. Um, as quick as that may seem, that is the end of chapter 10. I'm going to move on to chapter 11 in the next lecture, and we're going to keep moving through these very rapidly. Um, thank you for joining me. Have a great day.